Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. The passage we'll be looking at primarily this morning is found here in Matthew 12. It's also found in Mark 2 and in Luke chapter 6, but we'll be focusing on Matthew 12 this morning. Beginning at verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions? how he entered the house of God, and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? Or have you not read, excuse me, uh, verse 6, but I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Departing from there, he went into their synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable than, than is a man than a sheep? So then, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal like the other. The Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. Let us seek the face of God once again, that he will help us as we study his word together. Let's pray. Once again, O God, we come before you and seek your face, that the realities of which we have sung, the things that we have heard from your word, you would grant unto us a measure of Help by your spirit to continue to worship you, to continue to fear you, to long for your smile, and to dread your frown. And with that gospel fear of you, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray you would deliver me from the fear of man, that none of that would hinder me from preaching your word. And you would deliver each one of us from unbelief that would keep us from hearing and obeying your word. Please instruct us and guide us. We thank you for the gracious promise that you grant your spirit to those who ask. So please, give us your spirit that he might continue with us as we hear and obey your word. We plead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you were to walk out of this building at some point and meet some men, uh, say on a Wednesday evening, talking in the parking lot, and you heard the uh, level of their volume increasing slightly, not to the point of any kind of a carnal disagreement, but you heard them talking about uh, politics, this one defending this particular candidate and his policies, another one defending this candidate and his policies. And then on another occasion at a church picnic, you happened to get together and, and you saw these two men again sitting off at one of the picnic tables and you heard them again talking about political viewpoints on this matter or that matter. And then, say, on another occasion, you're at a, 
at a softball game, and, and they have to be playing, but they're both sitting on the bench. And again, you, you overhear them, and, they, and they're talking politics again. I doubt any of you would say, I don't think these men care much about politics. I don't think you'd think that they were just talking about something that just kind of filled the time. It's obvious that from the fact that they're discussing it and discussing it with a measure of uh, vehemence, a measure of uh, passion, that there's, there's a real belief that there's something here in this thing called politics and in this particular party or this particular candidate. One man wrote that in the three years of Christ's ministry recorded in the Gospels, on six different occasions, he crossed swords with the Jews over the proper observance of the Sabbath, two of which are found in all three of the synoptic Gospels, both of which we've read this morning. Christ himself, this man goes on to say, taught six times about the Sabbath, whereas he taught only one, on only one occasion about murder and three times about marriage. If this commandment were destined for the dustbin, that is, the garbage pail of ceremonial law, why do the gospel writers devote so much attention to it? In today's churches, the fourth commandment is under attack. And in many places, it's not under attack because it's been completely jettisoned. But when we come to the New Testament and people say, well, you see that Jesus never repeated the, the fourth commandment, the apostles never repeated the fourth commandment, the fact of the matter is, why does Jesus spend so much time, as this writer says, crossing swords with the Pharisees on this particular commandment? And why did the gospel writers take up time to pen these events in their gospel records? If all Jesus really had to do was say, it's gone, I'm it, it's over. Or if it really was over, why not just leave it out entirely? This is just another indication, I believe, as to why, or evidence as to why we can see that the Sabbath, the observance of one day in seven, is still applicable Today, the fourth commandment has application to us today. And I know many of you have asked the question, we'll get to, Lord willing, next time, how the day changed and why we are first day Baptists and not seventh day Baptists. We'll come to that. But before we get there, we're looking this morning again at Jesus teaching on the Sabbath because many who say the Sabbath has passed away say Jesus has little or nothing to say of importance about the Sabbath as to how it applies to us. Now, how did we get here? Well, for those of you who are visiting, we're in the midst of a study on the life of Moses and his ministry. And we've come to that time in his ministry, which you could call a mountaintop experience. He's at Sinai with all the people, and God is speaking to the people of Israel his commandments to give direction for how they ought to live in covenant with God. How can they enjoy the blessings that God has promised to them? And we've come to the fourth commandment. And in looking at the fourth commandment, we've seen that the fourth commandment is rooted in creation. And more than one writer said that this is really the pivotal issue on the Lord's day. The Sabbath was made for the man. God set aside one day in seven for Adam. Before there was any sin in the world, he had this cadence to his life, six days you shall labor, but the seventh is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. The seventh was a day that God blessed and sanctified set it apart for his purpose, for him to shower blessings upon his people. 
And so in the creation, we see the beginnings of one day in seven. We come to Sinai then where God codifies it. God writes it down, as it were, with his own finger, makes it part of those ten principal commands to direct his people how they can live in covenant relationship with God. And from there we went and looked at Isaiah chapter 58 at a time in the history of Israel where they had apostatized or they were looking at an apostate nation and, and he's giving directions to them and he says part of the covenant renewal, part of the renewal of, of your relationship with God is taking this day and keeping this day in the way that God wanted it to. And as it were, he, he draws them with these glorious promises that you will ride upon the high places and you will eat of the heritage of Jacob. If you delight in my day, call it delightful and honorable. And if you delight in the exquisite pleasure of God. Well, now we've come to the instruction that's found in the New Testament, and we're coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and his relationship to the Sabbath. And we've seen already Jesus' practice of the Sabbath. He ordinarily attended the synagogue on the Sabbath. He customarily taught in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He frequently offended the Jews, often in the synagogue, on the Sabbath. You could say, in summary... Jesus remembered the Sabbath day and kept it holy. Jesus has much to say about the Sabbath. And in looking at this passage last week, Matthew chapter 12, and this basic overarching heading is Jesus' teaching on the Sabbath, we saw, first of all, that Jesus taught that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This was his climactic pronouncement on this particular occasion. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The chief biblical argument then is that this goes back to creation. Jesus looks to that. And he says this was meant to be a blessing to man. And I am Lord of the Sabbath. In essence, I am the Son of Man, his favorite title for himself. I have always been Lord of the Sabbath. When I worked six days and rested on one in creation. When I stood on Mount Sinai and spoke the law to my people. When I, through the prophets, told them of these blessings that were theirs. I am and always have been, and always will be, Lord of the Sabbath. But now we come back to this passage to learn a second truth. And there's going to be a little more teaching than preaching this morning. I, I'm sorry that that's the case. I trust, nevertheless, it will be profitable as we work through this passage. The second thing that we see that Jesus taught. Jesus taught that compassion is essential to keeping the Sabbath. Compassion is essential to keeping the Sabbath. And we've looked at verses 1 to 8 in Matthew chapter 12. I've read that. That's what we'll be looking at this morning. Jesus points out that they are missing something which is obvious from the scriptures. Now note, first of all, with me, the offending activities again. We read here and in Luke 6 and verse 1, a full... full Fuller description, it came about that on a certain Sabbath, he was passing through some grain fields and his disciples were picking, eating the heads, rubbing them in their hands. The Pharisees saw men harvesting, threshing, preparing food. They saw what they thought were Sabbath breakers. They weren't stealing, they were gleaning appropriately in that, in one sense. But the, the Pharisees thought this was breaking the Sabbath for harvesting and threshing on God's day. But what Jesus saw was something far different. The offending activity in Jesus' eyes is that he saw people in need, 
he saw God meeting that need in the appointed way of gleaning. For it says in Matthew 12 and verse 1, the disciples became hungry. They were walking along on this Sabbath day, and for their activities, whether they'd had breakfast, whatever time of the day it was, they were hungry. So there's the offending activities, as the, the Jews and the Pharisees at least saw it. But then Jesus addresses some obvious biblical answers. Obvious biblical answers. For notice with me, I say obvious because Jesus says to them twice, verse 3 and verse 5, Have you not read? Now who's he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. The ones who knew the law, the keepers of the law, the ones who disseminated the law, who noted themselves or who, pr who promoted themselves as knowing the law. And Jesus says, have you not read? And in verse 7, if you had known, and the one thing he does say about their accusation is you would not have called the innocent guilty. So these are obvious answers. Jesus makes it clear that the Pharisees' view of the Sabbath is inconsistent with the Old Testament view of the Sabbath. He does not say your view of the Sabbath is inconsistent with me. Your view of the Sabbath is, is inconsistent with the Bible that you have to this point. And notice that Jesus does not say, as I've already made mention of, as he could have said, the Sabbath is passing away. Why is this big deal about nothing? But if they had understood their Old Testament, then they would not have condemned his disciples as they did. So it's obvious what Jesus is about to say. In his view, it should have been obvious to the Pharisees. So let's look at this obvious evidence as he sets forth. Jesus again taught that compassion is essential to keeping the Sabbath. The first thing he does is he looks at the clear example of David and the consecrated bread. David and the consecrated bread. This incident is found, and this part of the incident is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's drawing upon the illustration from 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. You'll recall David is fleeing from Saul. He's fearing for his life. He leaves without any weapons. He leaves without any food. He evidently draws to himself a, a, a small band of men. He goes to Nob and he comes to the uh, place of worship there and he asks for a sword and for food. He is given the sword of Goliath and the priest, Ahimelech, gives him the food that he wants. He gives him bread, and it's the bread of the presence. That is, those 12 loaves that are set on the table there in the holy place. And it's those 12 loaves that every Lord's Day are taken down and replaced with fresh loaves. Every Sabbath day, I should say, that these are replaced. And so this is the event that Jesus looks to when he sees this, when he hears this accusation. Now these both these events are very parallel in many ways. That's why Jesus chose this event. They're parallel in the fact that they both took place on the Sabbath day. This took place on the Sabbath. The bread was changed on the Sabbath. They both deal with the Lord's anointed. David in the first occasion, Jesus in the second occasion, and those following with him. They both deal with the reality of relieving hunger. And they are about the Lord's business. And so he draws on this illustration. The bottom line of this illustration is this. He looks at this and he says, David was given bread which would, it was not lawful for him to get. We read in Leviticus 24 verse 9 this. It shall be for Aaron and his sons, speaking of the bread, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from Jehovah's offerings by fire, his portion forever. So this was bread that was set apart and the priests were allowed to eat it. On this particular occasion, Ahimelech says, you know, I think I can stretch this principle a little bit. And I think I can 
give some of this to David and his men to help satisfy their hunger. Now this is the only command at any point made in the Old Testament as to whether or not this bread, how this bread should be treated. And so the bottom line with the argument then is this, I think Joseph Piper finds it, or declared it best when he said this, for this first argument, Jesus teaches that on the Sabbath we may do those necessary things that strengthen us for the Lord's work. David needed strengthening. David's men needed strengthening. They needed to eat. It was a necessity that they eat. Jesus and his disciples are out. They're hungry. It's a necessity that they eat. And he's saying, look at these two parallel. If you had looked at David and you didn't condemn David, and David's not condemned anywhere in the scriptures for what he did, and even if it's considered truly unlawful, the principle was he was given bread, if you would looked at that principle, you wouldn't have condemned us. Prudent compassion may result then in activities being performed on the Sabbath to fulfill legitimate needs. This is Jesus' point in pointing to David. However we understand the relationship between the bread and whether it was lawful or how it was lawful, whether it was just unlawful because of the fair in the Pharisees' eyes, or it was truly unlawful in God's eyes, the fact is this, at this point, a ceremonial law is set aside for a necessity for David. Prudent compassion then by Ahimelech resulted in an activity to sustain his life. And so Jesus draws the principle Prudent compassion may result in activities being performed on the Sabbath to fulfill legitimate needs. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, he then adds another illustration, another point, an Old Testament example. In verses 5 and 6, we read of the priests. Jesus says, Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are in innocent? He's referring to what the priests do in the temple on the Lord's Day, or excuse me, on the Sabbath. I call it the Lord's Day because it's always been the Lord's Day. It was the Lord's Day in Genesis. It was the Lord's Day in, in on Mount Sinai. It was the Lord's Day throughout. So I, I have the tendency to use that language for both Old and New Testament now as I've been studying this. But I'll try to keep straight in your mind. He's talking about the Sabbath, the Old Testament Sabbath. And he's saying, on the Old Testament Sabbath, the priests in the temple, the priests in the tabernacle, didn't have inactivity. They didn't even lessen their activities. Instead, the normal activities of the week were intensified. They doubled their sacrifices. They doubled their work on the Lord's Day. In Numbers 28, verses 9 and 10, we read this. On the Sabbath day, two male lambs, one year old, without defect and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as grain offering and its libation. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath in addition to the continual burnt offering and its libations. So they intensified their work. Well, Pharisees, by your standards, they're breaking the Sabbath. They're profaning the Sabbath in the most, uh, most grievous way according to your standards. For they are doing more work instead of less work in the very place of God's special presence. And it's the fact that we know that the priests are not offending God, but obeying God when they do this, that we realize that Jesus is not saying that they're actually breaking the Sabbath or profaning the Sabbath or doing something wrong, but that the Pharisees, by their standard, they would be. And that's why I think in the first instance it's something similar. He's saying, by the Pharisaic standard, David sinned, Ahimelech sinned, just by showing kindness and compassion and sharing this bread. In which case now Jesus is making this point with this second illustration. Pious devotion may require the performance of necessary activities to fulfill one's religious duties to worship God. Pious devotion may require, that is, if I am devoted unto God and in a religious way engaging in the worship that God has called me to engage in, fulfilling the duties that God has called me to do, that may require some activities 
to be done in order for that to take place. For instance, somebody had to turn the lights on here this morning. Somebody had to get the AC running before you all got here, or the first hour would have been unbearable and we would have all been sweating. Somebody had to come and engage in various activities to prepare this room on this day so that we could gather here and worship comfortably and undistracted. Those are necessary activities. This day, by and far, is not a very restful day for me because of the duties of the day. I'm working. I've been working. And I will continue working. And through the afternoon, as we interact with one another, I will continue to work. And tonight, we'll come back and we'll continue to work. The priests in the temple had to work on the Sabbath day. There are pious religious duties that require certain ones to work. They're not profaning or breaking the Sabbath in any way. They are deeds of pious devotion requiring activities and energy. And there's a sense in which all of us ought to be engaged in work today. You see, according to the Pharisees' standards, if we followed their rules, the Lord's Day would be a day of complete inactivity and all of us would be lying at home in our beds. Because ultimately we couldn't pick up enough weight to get ourselves dressed. We certainly couldn't have put in all that energy and work to start our cars and all that work that was being done to move those engines and move 2,000 pounds or 1,000 pounds of metal. You know how much, how we broke the, the three fig rule a long time ago. But you see, it's not what the Sabbath was meant to be. There are religious activities as Jesus draws and he says, your Pharisaic view of the Sabbath does not jive with God's view of the Sabbath as recorded in his word. Whether we're looking at David or whether we're looking at the priests. If it was, for, if it was true for worship in the temple, then Jesus adds, then how much more now? Look at what Jesus says right after he speaks of the temple and the worship there. He says, but I say to you that something or someone greater than the temple is here. If in the place of God's special presence under the old covenant, they were not breaking the Sabbath, when they were engaging in the worship that God required, when they came and were devoting themselves to worship God and were energetically giving themselves to do that, and on the Sabbath multiplied those efforts, then how much more now standing not in the temple, but standing in the presence of the living temple, the living presence of God among men. Emmanuel, God with us. If it was okay then, then how much more is it okay to do the such things in my presence when I am going about the Lord's work as I am Emmanuel, the word that became flesh. Again, Joseph Piper, and I hope you'll get his book if you haven't gotten it already, very helpful material in that book. Therefore, he says, those who labored with him, that is, those who labored with Jesus, his disciples, in his Sabbath work, were not violating the Sabbath when they broke a humanly invented law. To the contrary, they were doing the true work of the Sabbath as they labored with Jesus in the service of preaching, evangelizing, and worshiping. They were the true Sabbath keepers, while the Pharisees who followed them, seeking to entrap the Savior, were the ones breaking the Sabbath. So Jesus is teaching here, compassion is essential. We're coming to that point, and he does that, he builds up to that by first looking at David and showing that prudent compassion may result in activities being performed on the Sabbath to fulfill legitimate needs, what are commonly called duties of necessity. Or secondly, pious devotion may require the performance of necessary activities to fulfill one's religious duties of worshiping God, which were commonly called either uh, duties of uh, works of necessity or works of piety. We come now to the third line of evidence that Jesus puts together here or in dealing with the Pharisees, the patent prophetic principle regarding the heart, verse 7. If you had known what this means, 
Again, this should have been obvious to them. If they'd read their Bibles, it should have been well known to them. If you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now here I would like you to turn with me to another passage. It's the passage that Jesus quotes here. It's in Hosea. Hosea chapter 6. The first of the minor prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Hosea chapter 6. chapter begins with God giving this call, or the, or the prophet giving this call to the people that they would return to Jehovah, that they would know Jehovah. Verse 3, let us know, let us press on to know Jehovah. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. But then notice verse 6. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam or like man, they have transgressed the covenant. And how had the people of God transgressed the covenant? How had the people of God apostatized? In part, they, there they have dealt treacherously against me, God says. The prophet is dealing with the people and he's calling them to repentance. He's calling them to turn back to know the Lord. He's calling them to come and follow after the Lord. And he says, and the answer to this is not do a whole lot more religious activities. The answer to this isn't thousands of gallons of oil and thousands of sheep offerings and thousands of sacrifices. It's not that. It's not more external activity. It says, I delight in loyalty, in hesed, in mercy, in covenant faithfulness and love, not sacrifice. And notice the Hebrew parallelism. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. He's saying what's really important here in your present apostate state is that you turn your hearts back to God. That you know the Lord in a saving, trusting way. That you cast your cares upon Him and you turn your back on your sins and your apostasy. And so He's calling them to come and to know Him. He's calling them to covenant faithfulness and love. This is what God says, I want to see. And Jesus quotes that and says, you Pharisees have violated, you've missed this patent principle from the prophet. God wants your heart in covenant faithfulness more than he wants your external religious exercises. Now we must be careful when we read things and when I say things like that, we have to be very careful not to misunderstand. God is not saying... You can just ignore all my laws about how you ought to live and how you ought to worship me. I don't really care what you do externally. Do whatever you want. All I want is your, is your heart. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I want your heart first to be devoted to me in covenant faithfulness. I want your heart to be attached to me in loving commitment and belief. I want you to know me and follow after me and out of that heart to offer me the worship that I require of you. So it's the heart producing this external worship. That's what God is getting after. And that's what these Pharisees had missed. These Pharisees were merely involved and interested in all this external activity and setting down all these rules. Remember building that huge fence all around the law so that in no way anybody would ever get close to it and trample on it. And Jesus comes along and he just takes that fence and he just dismantles it and he pulls it down and he throws it away. He says, because my people need the law. 
And I want them to hear the law, and I want them to obey the law. And all of your externalism is not the answer. And if you had understood this principle, this principle of compassion, you would have realized that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. You would not have condemned my disciples who are innocent in their necessary activity. But notice how at the same time, by referring to this passage, how he condemns the Pharisees. For I read verse 7, because if the Pharisees really did know their scriptures but they'd missed it, then they would have heard these words, Apostate Israel dealt treacherously with me. And what was their activity? Presently? What are they doing? They're following Jesus around. They're following him and his disciples through the grain fields. As he's going to probably to the synagogue, it seems that that was where his destination was. And, and he's going along and they're following him. They're looking. They're trying to be treacherous. And the very next event, that's exactly what they're going to do. They're trying to catch him at every point. They are dealing with God treacherously even now and showing themselves to be apostate. They missed the point of the Sabbath. So in summary, if I can take the principles that we've seen here, we could say that there are certain works that are allowable on the Sabbath. Deeds of necessity, such as eating and preparing to eat. So the meal that many of the ladies have prepared and will set out and all that they will do to set the table out there and to, and to have places for us to eat and service for us and food for us. All of that is legitimate because we eat. And when somebody said, well, maybe the, the Sabbath ought to be a fast day. Well, if you look back at the Sabbaths in the Old Testament, more of them were called feast days than fast days. So the fact of the matter is, is there's nothing incoherent, there's nothing incon inconsistent with doing deeds of necessity in order to eat and prepare to eat and to go about the various activities necessary for us to be here and to worship God. There are many necessary deeds that have to be done and they are allowable on the Sabbath. There are also deeds of piety, performing our religious duties, engaging in the acti activities necessary to, to support and enable worship, as well as engaging in the activities of worship. And as I said, this is not a day of inactivity. You're not just supposed to come and sit in the pew and just be inactive. You are to be actively engaged in hearing and learning and growing and embracing and determining to take and apply and live out the things that are here. You are to be engaged with your whole heart when prayer is being offered up, seeking to lay hold of God yourselves. You are to be engaged when sitting in those pews and when standing and singing with our whole heart, bringing sacrifices to the living God. There is activity on this day. There is work that needs to be done. Joey Piper, I think, asks the very perceptive question. Here's the question you need to ask. Is this deed that I'm about to do, or the deed I'm considering, a deed of necessity or a deed of piety? Here's the question you need to ask. Does it promote the purposes of the day? Does it enable, am I doing something to enable us to worship together properly and to give myself to worshiping God? Does it serve that end? Is that what I'm doing and I have to do it to accomplish that end? Then it's a deed of necessity. I have to engage in this in order to, to fulfill my responsibility to offer up spiritual sacrifices? Then it's a deed of piety. Does it promote the purposes of the day? Not does it promote my comfort, personally and just significantly, that's all I'm concerning, concerned, about, concerned about. Not does it promote my pleasure, not does it promote my business week, not does it promote what I'm going to do on Monday, does it promote the purpose, the purposes of this day. So certain works are allowable on the Sabbath. Second, specific characteristics are needed, are needed in order to keep the Sabbath in these circumstances. And those two things are this, prudence and compassion. So what is Jesus teaching us through these 
Old Testament illustrations on this particular occasion with this incident in the grain fields. What is Jesus teaching us? He's teaching us these things. There are characteristics, predominantly this is the bottom lesson, there are characteristics necessary for keeping the Sabbath day holy, and they are prudence and compassion. Prudence and compassion. Compassion. Looking at somebody who's hungry, and not saying to them, well, I'm sorry, you should, have, you should have eaten. You should have taken care of that before. You say, wait a minute, I, maybe I did. Maybe I'm particularly hypoglycemic. Maybe I'm diabetic. Maybe, maybe I'm just somebody who's got a high activity. My body just burns to I've got to eat. Maybe it's some other necessary activity. But you see, compassion says, I can allow that to be done on this day. I can allow that because I can look at this situation and I can have compassion on the person involved and I'm not just looking at rules and rubrics for the day involved. Jesus said, if you had known this, covenant loyalty and compassion, compassion not only to me but to God's people, passion toward those in need. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, though, at the same time, and so all that is done is to be done under his rule. And so we need prudence as we assess these various activities. We may not violate one of God's moral laws and call it a deed of necessity. You can't do that. The work must be truly one of necessity. And again, listen to Dr. Piper because he captured exactly what I wrestle with and what I want to press on you. It is not carelessness which makes something a necessity. It is not carelessness that makes something a necessity. It's usefulness in enabling you to perform the purposes of the Sabbath. So we need compassion that we will think about doing good, and we'll see more of that in just a minute, but we need wisdom as well. And it's not one without the other. We need both. But now I hasten on to the second illustration because it adds another dimension. We've seen that Jesus taught that compassion is essential in keeping the Sabbath. Compassion, and I would add prudence, are essential to keeping the Sabbath. But then this third thing that Jesus taught in this incident back in Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 9, Matthew 12, beginning at verse 9, Jesus taught that it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Well, you say that's a no-brainer. Well, obviously it wasn't a no-brainer, and there's some lessons that we need to learn here, or it wouldn't have been emphasized. This is the dominant lesson of the various circumstances where they cross swords, where they fight or they address the issue of the Sabbath with the Pharisees, is this issue of what is lawful on the Sabbath. Again, each of the Synoptic Gospels includes this incident in the synagogue immediately after the event in the grain field, even if it's not necessarily on the same day. First of all, notice with me the evidence of the Pharisees' hard hearts. We read here that they question. They question Jesus. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Their posture in Mark is that of watching Jesus. And Luke adds the, the word closely. They are standing there, scoping out Jesus, watching every move that he's going to make in light of his being there in the, sa in the synagogue, and there's this man with this withered hand. The assumptions, notice the assumptions behind their question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They were hoping to catch him. They're hoping to accuse him. So what are the assumptions? That he can heal, and that he has a heart to heal. Because they're hoping he will heal. So they can accuse him of violating the Sabbath. Can you imagine? 
They have no concern for this man with a withered hand. They're not doing anything for him. And they know that the one standing before them can actually do something about this. Now, we could multiply instances in the Gospels where this kind of thing took place. Jesus was one who taught on the Sabbath and who cast out demons on the Sabbath. He, he healed Peter's mother-in-law on the Sabbath. That's already happened. On other occasions, in Luke 13 and Luke 14 and John 5 and verse 9, we have the incident of him healing the woman who for 18 years had been bound up and, and bent over with a con some condition. He healed a man of dropsy right there in the Pharisee's own house, and this question is asked, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? He heals the man at the pool of Bethesda, and everybody wonders, what are you doing carrying your pallet? Who healed you? And they begin to complain and be concerned that he did this on the Sabbath day, or when he made mud from spittle and put it on the blind man's eyes. The man had been blind from birth, and all they can do is argue with him, and they kick him out of the, out of the synagogue. The hardness of their hearts is so evident all over this passage and other passages like it. Knowing what they knew about Jesus, they do not humble themselves before him. They have no compassion in their hearts. They don't come to him and say, Oh, Jesus, do something about this man who's withered. Do something about this man who's blind. Do something about this man who can't get into the pool. Oh, Jesus, with your power and with your heart, would you do something? But they see his power and his heart, and they try to use it against him to catch him. So Jesus, on this particular occasion, he goes up to the trap, as it were, think of a a little snare that's out there and it's got the trip stick and he goes up to it and he grabs the stick and yanks it away. He says, okay, I see your trap. Let me ask you something. Well, the first thing we read in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 11, we'll follow Matthew's order. It's a little bit different than the other gospel accounts, but basically the same thing. The first thing he does is he says to the Pharisees, um, do you care for your animals on the, on the Sabbath? Uh, which one of you doesn't have compassion upon his animal who gets in a bad place on the Sabbath day. Which one of you doesn't do this? You have compassion for the animals. And then he catches them on the horns of a dilemma. He says, is not man worth more? I've got to find my passage here, Matthew chapter 12. Is not man worth more than the animals? Verse 12, how much more valuable then is a man than a sheep. <laughs> well, you just kind of see them standing there going, well, you know, I, you know I, I had that donkey yesterday. Oh, I had that sheep. Okay, yeah, I did that. Well, what's more important, the man or the sheep? Well, you couldn't even dig a man out if a, if a wall had fallen on him. If you dug him out and said, well, he's still okay. I'll wait till, I'll wait till the next day to, dig, to finish the digging. Or, oh, he's a Gentile. I may not get back to that one at all. I mean, the, whole, the whole posture was, one that was no compassion, no thought. They just only thought of themselves. They only thought of, of these menial things. They're animals, but they had no thought for man. But Jesus says, men are worth more than animals. And so Jesus articulates the truth and exposes their error. Now, in the other Gospels, in Mark 3 and in Luke 6, Jesus asks a question. So I think that it goes something like this. He puts this out before them, and, or maybe he asks the question before. Um, is it lawful? on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? Huh, that's obvious. If, if those are my choices, then it's certainly better to save a life than to kill it. Well, if I don't save a life that's dying, then what have I done? I killed it. So in other words, I have to do good. I have to do good. And so doing good on the Sabbath is obviously good. And so Jesus then makes this declaration. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It is lawful to show mercy on the Sabbath. It is lawful to meet specific needs, to help people, to strengthen people, to deal with their specific lack on the Sabbath. And in Mark's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, we read, they were silent. And then we see Jesus in the midst of this pasture 
midst of this passage, having exposed the Pharisees' hard hearts, he now has, we have the contrast to the Pharisees' hard hearts. They ignored this man with the withered hand. Jesus calls him forward. Rise, come forward. And then Jesus looks around at the, at the Pharisees with anger. And he's angry because of the grief in his heart at the hardness of their hearts. And Jesus takes care of the problem. He exercises his power mercifully. Stretch forth your hand. And these hard-hearted Pharisees see the compassion of the great Savior on this, the Sabbath day, and they want to kill him. Brethren, in closing, the applications, I think, are simple from this text. First of all, the day is not a day of inactivity. There are all kinds of work that we're to be engaged in in our holy convocations. In every event that we gather on the Lord's Day, it is to be our focused attention to be a day unto him. We are to engage in works of piety. We are the priesthood of believers, and we are to offer up our spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. This is the market day of the soul. This is the day that we need to labor for the good of our souls. As hard as we would labor for the good of our companies or our families on any other day. But there are some severe warnings that we need to have set before us that grow out of this passage. We must beware of rigid, pharisaic application of the Lord's Day or the Sabbath. We need to beware of hypocritical, formalistic keeping of the Lord's Day, the external activities with no heart of devotion and compassion to God and toward man. It's a day that was made for man. Primarily for the spiritual man, for his spiritual good, but also for his physical good. Beware then also of ignoring or minimizing the Lord's day. And beware of a lack of compassion and a lack of prudence. You see, some of you, you need to hear the word to be compassionate. This is the Lord's day because you're all good with your rules. Some of us, we're real easy to set up our fences. <laughs> Don't you cross the fence? And, and we see somebody cross what we think is the fence, and wow, well, we peg them. Sabbath breaker, Sabbath breaker, Sabbath breaker. But others of us, we need prudence <laughs> because we're willing to cut corners at every point and say, well, that's a necessity. That's a mercy. Because we were careless, because we were unprepared, because we were lazy. In fact, it wasn't a necessity at all. We could have gotten on without it. You see, we need compassion and prudence on this day. And then let us learn from this that compassion and the, the Sabbath are not incompatible, but are very compatible. We are not keeping the Sabbath if we're only concerned about ourselves. Even the fourth commandment says we're to be concerned about those around us, that they enjoy the rest. We should be desirous that others would also enjoy the Sabbath blessings. And we should not make sure that all of the people in our household are keeping the law like some sort of Pharisee. Are you going to church? Are you no, it should be out of compassion. This is good for your soul. I want you to come along to church, and I want you to sit there and listen to your Sunday school teachers and listen to the sermon, and I want you to take the afternoon and, and study, and I want to read with you and interact with you. Why? Because this is a good day. And I want you to have those blessings. So come along. Now, I don't want to. Come along. You will. Come. But I want you to have the blessings. So we need to do that with a compassionate, bent, exercising authority compassionately. And in the context of Isaiah 55, we need to be delighting in this day so that others can delight in this day. And when we're showing compassion, when we're showing mercy, it needs to be done in a way that's compatible with the fact that this is the Lord's day. The Sabbath is thoroughly merciful. And the most merciful thing we can do for any person is to have them sit under the sound of the gospel, to sit in the place where people of God are singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. It's the most merciful thing we can do. For this is the place where God meets with his people. 
But that doesn't mean we can't show mercy. Matter of fact, we ought to be showing mercy as God gives opportunity to do so. But it's very interesting that Jesus never did mercy except, as the, at least the illustrations here, much of the mercy that's shown on the Sabbath was in the synagogue. So they didn't fight with one another. They blended together very nicely. Ultimately, mercy is to be shown to them that they might find mercy from the Lord of the Sabbath. Listen to Bruce Ray. Jesus taught both by precept and by example that it is proper to do those things on the Sabbath which refresh, heal, and restore the strength to the body. Thus, not only works of worship and piety, but works of necessity and mercy are appropriate Sabbath activities. And so the brethren that go to the nursing homes in the afternoon and the brethren that help others in need in the afternoon, those are certainly appropriate activities on the Lord's day. But I close with this. My time is gone. I close with this one quote. And may this ring in some of your ears. Robert Murray McShane said this, there are no Sabbaths in hell. God's given you a Sabbath rest today among God's people. But you reject the Lord of the Sabbath. You turn your back on him and do not approach him and know him and believe upon him. And one day your Sabbath rests will be over. And there will be no Sabbath rests in hell. May God be merciful to you this day. Let's pray. Father, please help us to avoid the various sins of Phariseeism and abuse of your day. Help us to find that biblical balance with prudence and compassion and in piety be able to worship you as you ought to be worshipped and to do good to mankind as we have opportunity, as you give opportunity to do so. Please help us then, Lord, as we seek to keep this day holy. And we do it because we love the Lord Jesus Christ and follow after him who is Lord of the Sabbath. Hear and answer our prayers offered to you in his name. Amen.